Welcome back to the uh, Nutramedical Report, and uh, we have Stan Dale on. Stan, I want you to give us uh, kind of some background of uh, uh, what you see are the key issues nowadays. We have a lot of space weather this year. NASA is designated to the year of the comet. We have a fairly large uh, asteroid that's going to pass lower than the actual many of our communication satellites on Friday, my birthday. Uh, it's been upgraded in size up to 500 by 500 meters, which is a pretty de- big uh, asteroid. In fact, the uh, some of the experts have stated that it is, quote, 15 minutes uh, from hitting Earth. In other words, it was like a bus schedule, and it was whipping across in space. It literally is so close. It's like, uh, as they say in the military, when you hear the bullets whiz, it means you're not hit. And this one is a bullet that's going to make a whizzing sound as it passes Earth. Uh, we also have some fairly large comets, and you're an expert in plasma physics, that our other scientists, Professor McKinney stated, could cause some major uh, effects on the Earth and on the sun, such as sun, solar superstorms. Uh, but we're involved with lots of uh, interesting things that tie in with uh, a lot of theories that you've uh, put forward over the years. Plus, you've got comments on other, uh, on other issues. So let's start talking about space weather, comets, and asteroids first, and then let it go where it needs to and to talk about maybe Second Amendment and things that are happening with the State of Israel and the Middle East, etc. Okay. Say, Bill, are, are you getting over a cold there? Uh, yes, actually, and I'm doing very nicely because they have all my fancy nutraceuticals, thank God, because I'm certain that this particular cold, uh, which I got when I flew back from Florida, is a, um, is a devil of a cold. Uh, luckily, I have my Nutridine and all my fancy nutraceuticals, and, and, and uh, unlike some of my colleagues like Tim Alexander, I did not have to visit the local hospital, thank God. Dang. So, all right, well, it's, it's on the, you're on the mend then, right? Doing fantastic, actually. Well, you got to get cleaned up by Friday for your birthday. Oh, absolutely. Well, I actually am cleaned up now. The thing is, I have the, you know, it's like anything. You're 100% feeling, but the very last thing that gets better is a little bit of a, you know, a, the voice. But even though my lungs are completely clear, sinuses, everything, energy, no aches and pains, nothing. Uh, and, of course, I'm taking all my fancy nutraceuticals. There's a little bit in your voice to say, oh, you sound terrible. Well, no, I don't feel terrible. I feel fantastic. Um, you know, I remember so, that, yeah. And that often is the case. So uh, <laughs> luckily I have How all my How old will you be on Friday? Friday? I'm going to be 61. 61? You're just a kid. Yeah, 61, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, last week there. I had my 68, so we're not far apart in birthdays. There you go. Well, they say older and wiser, hopefully. Um, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> All As right, you get now, older, yeah. So tell us, give us some of your wisdom. What's going on with the space weather this year? Okay, there are a number of things. Um, the The sun goes through sunspot periods, you know, every um, 11.8 years on average, and it uh, is when we have a maximum number of sunspots. It's called a solar sunspot cycle. And um, we've had 24 of those since they started record-keeping on sunspot activity. Um, which means that roughly we've got roughly 280 years worth of data. But this particular solar cycle, the 24th, is not seeing a lot of sunspots. It's seeing some interesting coronal holes, which are uh, magnetic holes that form and spit out coronal mass ejections and solar wind, uh, extreme solar wind in the form of flares and things like that. And that will shoot particles at us at about one and a half to two million miles an hour, which is reasonably fast. Now, we NASA is calling this particular solar cycle a grand solar maximum. Now, we've had solar maximums, you know, as I said, for 280 years, every 11.8 years. But this is called a grand one, and this is the first one they've ever called a grand solar maximum. And we don't have a huge number of sunspots. So you think, well, why are they saying it's a grand solar maximum? It's because there's a lot of energy coming out of the sun in erupted uh, displays of, you know, flares and uh, coronal mass ejections and solar wind densities and all kinds of stuff. We've got one that's headed our way. It should hit us uh, in the next uh, day or so, and uh, it's going at about 1.8 million miles an hour. And it'll be a grazing small blow, so it's not going to create an EMP EMP effect on our electricity and our power networks. But at the same time that this is happening, 
we have a, a, an asteroid passing, as you said, inside the orbits of our geostationary satellites, which are mainly communication satellites. This thing's going to be about maybe 25,000 miles from the surface of the Earth, give or take a bit. Its uh, name is 2012 DA-14. Now, what people really don't consider, because it's not a, a very normal thing, is that when this something like this is coming that close to the Earth and you get a coronal mass ejection, you know, charged particles coming at 2 million miles an hour toward the planet, this might affect the orbit a bit of that asteroid before it hits us. And that's something that wasn't in the equation. So it'll be exciting to see what happens with this uh, coronal mass ejection and the, 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 the high-energy particles that are going to be hitting us thing as it approaches us on the 15th and see if it comes even closer than we thought or if it moves further away. But it's going to have so, an effect, I'm sure. So in other words, it could push it uh, further closer than we thought. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's only a 15-minute difference, a 15-minute window in the orbit, and it would have directly impacted the planet. So, well, Tunguska was different. quite a bit smaller than this. Apparently, the asteroid that caused the Tunguska explosion in Siberia, I think it was 1905, was quite yeah, a bit smaller. It was, yeah. it was quite a bit smaller by calculation, some of the uh, astrophysicists have uh, said. So the one that we're, is going to pass this is quite a bit bigger than the Tunguska one that flattened about 100,000 square miles of forest by an airburst. Well, there were a number of uh, discussions on that since 1905, trying to figure out why they could never find <laughs> meteor debris in the center of the impact area. And it was certainly, as you say, easy to, to see the impact center because everything radiating out from it was flattened for hundreds of miles. It was a nasty thing. Now, one of the groups that have studied this, of, of uh, astronomers, said, look, Maybe it's like uh, an electric universe, like Velikovsky and uh, McCain and some of the others have said. And maybe when that asteroid got close to the surface of the Earth, it, uh, it had such a huge buildup of electric charge that a lightning flash came from the asteroid that was almost to the ground, but not quite, to the Earth. And the heat of the exchange of energy between the Earth and that uh, a comet or that uh, asteroid caused it to explode. Maybe to even you know release a, a nuclear type explosion. I don't know, but it didn't hit the Earth, but it made a big damage. It was an airburst. So now uh, we have an asteroid coming within you know twenty five thousand miles or so. I don't think we'll see an arc you know reach out that far, but it is a definite possibility that something like that can fall into our atmosphere again and right. short out and cause a big explosion. Now, besides uh, that consequence, one of the other things that McKinney mentioned, and I want to check it with you on it, is that these can, uh, depending on alignment with planets, they can cause plasma effects. They can trigger off earthquakes, volcanoes, and extreme weather as well. Is that a possibility? Well, so, um, in other words, they don't even have to pass low enough in order to cause an explosion, but their plasma discharges can trigger off weather, earthquakes, and volcanoes. Well, it's not a stretch of the imagination at all. I mean, I've tracked data since about 1996 um, looking at variations in the sea surface temperature of the Earth in the entire planet. And there have been two or three occasions where we had a, a large coronal mass ejection strike the electromagnetic field of the Earth, and it caused energy to pump in through the uh, electromagnetic field into the core of the planet and bounce around for two or three days. And I would see... Maybe in one case up uh, northeast of Japan, just a little bit south uh, east of, um, sorry, uh, northwest of Japan, and um, no northeast and southeast of Kamchatka, there was about an 800 mile diameter hot spot, a real hot circular spot that formed just after that coronal mass ejection hit our electromagnetic field. That's charged uh -huh. particles, right? And right. so it bounced around. The next day, it was over in the Atlantic. Wow. That's really interesting, and of course that fits in with your theories about the piezoelectric uh, measurement triggering uh, as a predictive mechanism for predicting earthquakes that is more accurate than any other system I've heard of uh, anywhere on the planet. Welcome back, and we're joined with uh, Stan Dale. It's really great to have you back on the program, Stan, because uh, you provide a level of scientific validity and uh, advanced understanding of the global dangers 
And you can do it from a biblical point of view because you can see there's a number of converging things. Signs in the heavens, this year is designated by NASA as the year of the comet. There's three major comets that are going to pass through the inner solar system. All of them could have effects on Earth weather, space weather, and solar superstorms. That if they're Earth centric, we could have some big problems on planet Earth. True, true. The, um, the, the, the system that we live in, the solar system, is definitely more closely connected than people realize. They, they tend to think that just because gravity and magnetism appear to be local, event, local effects around a you know, planet or moon or a star, that things that happen on the other side of the solar system don't bother us, but they do. We're in a charged envelope of spinning fluid that you can't see, and it directs the planets and the comets and things where they, they need to go. Uh, it's like it's like an invisible water stream, but, but it's very fine uh, atomic structures. Now, because of that, when things enter in, like you know, a comet coming in uh, later in this uh, year, around October, November, being closer to the sun, it's going to cause the sun to it's a comet grazer, or a sun grazer, it's called. It's going to come close to the surface of the sun, and it's going to cause the sun to emit a lar- large um, plasma stream. I've seen it happen several times before with smaller comets, with sun grazers as well. Now, where that um, sun grazing emission or your post-passing uh, emission comes out of the sun, you will see stuff shoot out. I don't think that from looking at the orbital plot that that's going to be a problem uh, for people on Earth. But we will see uh, debris trail above and below our orbit, and uh, same for Mars which may catch some of the straggling debris behind that comet, which would be a lot of small uh, meteors and things like that that uh, we could see as showers. However, there are other things out there I'm sure that we haven't detected because they're not bright enough. They don't reflect or they don't emit light. So our telescopes can't see something 100, 200 feet in diameter or larger because it's just not lit up. These things we have to watch for, and Space Command has told Holly and I when we were there that there are a lot that they know that they haven't detected yet. Yeah, exactly. In fact, uh, the thing that I found when I was a civilian and got uh, clearance, Q-level clearance, as a doctor taking care of employees working at U.S. Space Command, Colorado Springs, 94-95, is that uh, they try to track things right down to the size of an eraser. Because an eraser traveling at 35 or 45,000 miles an hour will puncture through a communication satellite or the space station or something and destroy it. And so they often will try to move things out of the way if they see a track. Um, but there's so many shards of, of material up there now. And with things like this uh, giant asteroid whipping through there, it probably has a debris field around it. It's traveling pretty fast. And it, it, I don't know if they... Uh, We'll get some degradation of some of the satellites, if, depending on the pathway it, it leads. Hey, this could be serious. Some of the uh, weekly television shows we got might get interrupted. There you go. It might uh, be, people might actually have to use zap pack to reality. Yeah, play Scrabble and cards and things and talk to each other without Maybe tweeting. It's just or tweeting. <laughs> that, that's funny. Without tweeting, and you know the funniest picture I've seen lately is four young people sitting around a table in a. Uh, in one of these kind of like malt shop restaurants, and uh, they're all the heads down, below table level, looking at their thumbs going really fast, tweeting each other uh, comments. I know what happened to talking. I saw that. <laughs> that's, that's the funniest picture I've seen in, in years. I look at it, I thought, what? I remember as a kid, you know, you drive 10 miles to draw, go drive on your bike, and I remember when I was, you know, 10, 11 years old, I drive. You know, 10, 12 miles, take a, uh, some plastic bag and my jig uh, and uh, fishing rod, and I'd go out and jig mackerel. Then take back a, a bag of mackerel and gut them and clean them, and then fry them right up myself, go out in the backyard, pick blueberries out of, the, out of the field, have my own garden of carrots and potatoes, go out and get those out of the ground, wash and clean them, and boom, just cook supper. That's yeah, 10, 11 years old. I mean, this is considered a fun day, you know. You go out and jig mackerel. I mean, uh, kids, when we were our age, we'd build tree houses and jump from one tree to another. You'd you put yeah. your chrome on the, on the scrapes and wounds, kick you back out, unless you had a bone sticking out because it was broken and sticking through the, the flesh. So you get back out there and play until you're sunburnt. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, my house, we, we, my, 
my friend and I used to make uh, rockets and sneak out to the railroad tracks and launch our rockets down the tracks. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 had a huge backyard. We do the same thing. I get my grandfather's two bows, and we'd uh, solder on some little with tin snips, little wings. And we made our own little homemade solid fuel rocket fuel and put little green men with their homemade parachutes from bread bread uh, bags. And you'd have the little oh, threads yeah. tied, to the, tied to it with the little green men, you know, the little army men. Shoot yeah, them up yeah, a I thousand remember. feet. Shoot them up a thousand feet and have the little rockets, you know. And you know, it, it, Hopefully the rockets wouldn't blow up on you, but uh, nothing like a little yeah. solid fuel ro- ro- tubo rocket from Cuba. Because that was before the Cuban Revolution. We could get the big aluminum tubos. Yeah. Yeah, I know we had one of our rockets. Uh, we, we thought we'd get smart and add magnesium powder to it, you know, flash powder. Oh, boy. Holy cow, when that sucker went off, we couldn't see for a few seconds because of the bright flash. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it it was one of the best launches we ever had. It came down way down the track. Um, and, and then we went to making things like potassium, permanganate, glycerin, uh, bottle bombs. And uh, Grandma was uh, over at my house taking care of me uh, one summer, and I... I remember going out in the backyard out where we had the trash cans. They're all metal. Uh-huh. And uh, the, the, the garbage truck had run over it before and dented it in, but there was still uh, you could hold garbage in it. And I remember taking you know, my little glass jar, you know, medicine jar of some type, and put the permanganate in it and then the glycerin and shook it up. And usually it would get a little bit warm before it would go off. But anyway, I waited one, two, three, and threw it into the garbage uh, can that was all dented. Well, boom, off it goes, right? And I mean, straightened out that garbage can like nobody's business, <laughs> and threw garbage everywhere. See, My grandmother came running out. I was in well, trouble. I, but. I, I think that play uh, created a different kind of generation of people that were creative. I'm very concerned about the young people now. They're completely tied to cyberspace, and don't have real contact with reality a lot, and don't have that inventive flair of dealing with reality. Um, it's, I am um, afraid to that. I'm concerned it's that they're creating a unidimensional kind of humanity that literally thinks and tweets. I know. It's, it's sad. It's just, I, I don't think it's like a normal generation gap where they say, oh, the kids aren't like we were in our day, but this is worse. It's just yeah, terribly I, I think, I, Yeah, I think it's very degenerative. Um, it, a couple scenarios that I think are likely to happen in the next couple of years. We're hitting solar max. We're likely to have space weather. I think the power grid is, uh, you know, I watch one of my favorite shows to watch. I don't know if you ever see it. Is Doomsday Preppers, and if you want yeah. to laugh your head off, if you want to uh, cringe because people grab on one or another thing, and I think some of these people are danger to themselves. I'm thinking they're not going to survive to live to Armageddon. They're going to kill each other with the stupid things they're doing. But I, um, I really think that we're the power grid is going and. Uh, in the next two years, I think there's going to be major challenges to the existence. At least big chunks of it are going to get knocked out by poor planning, by an ancient power grid that can't tolerate even putting on solar and wind, and let alone solar storms and super storms and everything else going on. When we come back, we'll talk more about this and much more with Stan Dale. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. So, Stan, I think that um, we talk about this in our prepper issues, which I think anybody who's a prepper basically is an American. All Americans originally were preppers. You, In fact, you wouldn't survive a winter. You wouldn't survive at all if you weren't a prepper. And that means having food, water, self-protection, uh, realizing you're personally responsible for your own health. You're responsible to have basic skill sets for EMT, emergency, cut, scrapes, wounds. I tell everybody they should get cert training and uh, get involved in volunteering with your local fire department, even if it's only part-time. You don't have to have a medical background. Have an emergency kit around and be prepared because if there's a true major emergency, you're not going to be able to call up the ambulance. They're not available. There's so many more serious situations going on where they can't get to you because the roads are down, the power's down, or there's no gas. So... Um, you know, your wife, Holly, has probably written the best book on preparation called Dare to Prepare. And I tell everybody they should get that book. Um, this is really serious that America 
is the lead nation in the world, and yet we're falling uh, down. A small percentage is for real preppers, real patriots. They realize if you want to have, like I presented last night to our HOA, and five of the eight homes that were there that that were actually at the meeting, they all agreed to put in a super well uh, because I put in my water recovery system this last year. I'm going to put in a gray water recovery system from our wash water uh, and uh, filter out the detergents and so on to put in our garden and greenhouse so we can filter all that stuff out. But I think that people don't realize water security isn't secure. Uh, in fact, in every utility uh, across North America, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, they have backup systems for pumping water, but not sewage. Uh, they don't have systems that are fully integrated. I mean, when you look at it, uh, people don't think things through. Utilities don't think things through. Local, uh, you know, emergency management organizations don't. It's just amazing. As Einstein says, genius is, is quantifiable, but stupidity is limitless. It's just, it just blows your mind, doesn't it? It does. What did Edison say? Uh, genius is what ninety five percent or five percent inspiration, ninety five percent elbow grease, something like that. Exactly. Yeah. So I put a bunch of elbow grease in to actually research this stuff, and the thing that you do is you cringe each time you find something that's even stupider than the last thing you found, and you realize that it's a real simple solution. Uh, you know, water recovery from your roof, uh, gray water recovery from your, you know, your sinks and your showers. Just pull the detergent out and all the toxic stuff, and there's not much. It's basically soap off your body and off your dishes. Uh, pull that stuff out, put it through a proper filtration system, then it's perfectly fit to feed your gardens uh, because there's no heavy metals and chemicals and soap in it. Uh, I mean, people don't understand that, that you know, if, if our power goes out, like here in California, there's no water. They don't understand that if there's no water, you only have a matter of days before people are going to start dying like flies or drinking toxic water that will give you diarrhea that will kill you. Um, I'm very concerned because I think space weather, in the next two years especially, is going to put our power grid under a lot of duress. And I can't say if it's going to fail, but I think there's a pretty good chance a chunk of it's going to fail. You know, uh, we were talking before the break, or you know, on the break, you and I, uh, about a number of things, including the Middle East situation and things that are happening are going to happen this year over there. Could yeah, you're an expert affect. on that as well. You, you've written a lot on that, too. Well, I don't know why I'm an expert, but I sure study it a lot. Yeah. Um, the, the you have situation, a, in other words, you have a considered opinion on it, in other words, based on a lot of cons- consideration and research. Right. Now... One of the things that uh, you and I uh, can see happening here is that Israel is going to be forced to uh, defend itself and even make a preemptive strike on Damascus or Iran, uh, depending upon where the um, the nukes go, to keep right. them from launching something on Israel. I mean, at one time, Israel was only 17 miles in width in a certain place there. I mean, it's a small country and surrounded by a lot of larger countries. And if they get a short-range missile into uh, into Syria or into the Lebanon somehow. I mean, you know, it, they could launch it, and before Israel's defensive systems like Iron Dome could detect it and bring it down, it could it could detonate a nuclear uh, explosion over Israel and be an EMP type effect on their electronics as well. And then exactly. you can march in with troops. Now, so I don't know what Israel's going to do, but they have to do something. They have to try to defend themselves. Uh, and we we really cannot hold that against them. Now, when they do, Iran and uh, what's left of Syria, I think Damascus will get uh, destroyed in the process. But when they do, Russia is going to be called upon by Iran, Syria, and some other Middle East nations. Come down and help us. We've got uh, treaties with you for mutual defense. You come down and help us because Israel's attacking us, and the United States is going to attack us. Well, Russia, knowing this is on the cards for this year, is going to have to do something to neutralize America's potential involvement in defending Israel. Because, I mean, you know, we could change presidents overnight if one of them got hurt, if the president got hurt somehow, and, you know, uh, <laughs> Biden took over or something like that. So Russia cannot depend on the political stability of America, you know, continuing in a, in a situation like that. So Russia is going to have to go further in neutralizing the United States as a military defense option for Israel in the Middle East. 
that means that I think we're going to see fifth columnists destroying infrastructure here, and we're going to see nuclear bombs detonated in major cities here, which were probably tactical nukes that were sneaked in, and there will probably be an EMP attack over the upper atmosphere up over the middle of the United States, which will bring down most of our electronics in the civilian world. These things right. are, would be done by Russia, you know, using terrorists uh, inside the country, you know, Muslim terrorists, whatever, to to uh, bring America to its knees. So it's got so many problems internally and domestically that it could not possibly mount a serious defense against Russia moving in against Israel in the Middle East. Now, at that time, we're going to have big problems here, internal civil wars beating each other to death, while the Middle East, uh, if Russia will invade and uh, Israel on the northern uh, shores and mountains, and will die there. The, the army will die invading Israel. Now, I know this will happen at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation because it says they will burn the weapons of the of the army invading army that dies in the hills of, of Israel. They will burn those weapons for seven years. Well, that means at the beginning of the tribulation period, and that means that we think it's starting this year because America has got to go. Russia's got to defend, you know, Iran and, you know, Syria and all that. So you can see the whole package is coming together so that it is, it is almost impossible to not read prophecy in the Bible and say, ah, that's what's happening right now, and the next move is disaster in the Middle East and here. So I think that that's going to be another thing we have to consider in our... Yeah, I think you're, I think you're, you're, you're correct that... Without setting dates, I'd say during the second term of Obama, uh, he wants to bring in the uh, peace treaty. We, we see Russia completely uh, frustrated by America's determination to bring down the Syrian regime. The only port that they have in the Middle East is in Tartus. Um, I see uh, China is totally uh, making deals with America on the one hand to get 90% of the oil out of Iraq, but very ticked off with us and trying to, to get deals to get the Bakken oil, which we had a revelation about a week or so ago we put on the show, that the Chinese behind the scenes have got a sweetheart deal with about a 25% cents on the dollar cost to get access to Bakken oil as well from western the United States. China is building these trade zones inside America, including one up in Idaho that's 50 square miles, which I think is an obscenity. We have Obama basically uh, with an open door gate where you're shooting off the Southern Air Defense Command and our uh, high altitude of surveillance system uh, to make sure there's no incoming um, low-flying aircraft, drones, or, or cruise missiles. And as a result, uh, Obama is basically saying, come on down, you know, bring in nukes and trailers, uh, you know, have low-flying aircraft, uh, do anything you want. And um, it's almost like they're inviting uh, some form of terrorism or disaster so they can move to the next stage of whatever they want to do. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I see that. And um, certainly after the Civil War that weakens our defenses, uh, you can expect Russian and Chinese presence troops on the ground here and shortly thereafter. Yeah, and you can see Obama literally trying to push for a civil war because why would you start kicking down the doors of veterans' homes in the middle of the night by passing laws in various states or federal executive post-it notes? Let's do that right now then. Welcome back, and uh, we've got Stan Dale. Uh, if you go to Stan Dale, D-E-Y-O dot com, and you go to Stan's Corner and go to the uh, images section for show images, uh, there's an area on the very top that says Mitchell Shield Anomaly in the South Pacific. Uh, let's talk about that image uh, where if people want to pull it up right now, if they're online or if they're listening to the archives. Um, let's talk about it. Can you tell me what this means. Well, there's a couple of things going on, and um, you know I take the the, t the sea surface temperature anomalies daily, and uh, I, m I match that data through some other program stuff I got here to forecast where likely earthquakes will be, and it's a very accurate way to do it on, on earthquake zones that are uh, bordering on continents or in the water. Well, on the uh, 10th of January, I started noticing something uh, in the the rate of change, the rapid change of temperature in the ocean just east of uh, New Zealand. Now, I put uh, pictures on this uh, the, the uh, website there, the Missile Shield uh, site, which you can go, uh, scroll down and click on to get bigger pictures. 
uh, and I've circled and put an arrow at an area that formed a very unusual shape, which was um, kind of like a, an ellipse, where the core of it was one temperature and the outer core was another temperature. It was like a donut that was squashed a bit. And this really puzzled me. I thought, well, okay, that's, uh, that occurred. That's a strange anomaly, a storm or something. A couple of days went by, and it got even worse. It kept on getting worse for, you know, seven or eight days, and didn't disappear for about ten. So I thought, well, now, what is in that area of the ocean? There's nothing there. No volcanoes, this or that. What's on the exact opposite side of the planet, I thought? Well, what if this is some kind of a electromagnetic uh, harp-type or Tesla-type transmitter on the other side of the planet? What is exactly on the other side from the center of this anomaly? And to my surprise, it is the missile shield base in Romania that the United States and NATO are building, building over there. And I thought, right, if they've got a transmitter there that generates a field so that the, it's a standing wave field so that it forms a node on the other side of the planet and then reflects back to Romania and then back to the other side of the planet, back and forth, that kind of a shield Tesla talked about, you could cause missiles or things flying at a certain altitude and above that, at a certain speed or above that, you could cause them to generate electric shorts all through the circuitry and bring the missile down without even shooting at it. I thought, what a clever thing. Well, I read more about this missile shield site in Romania. It's not supposed to be operational until 2015, but they're doing some preliminary work now, they say. Okay, they're going to have 500 personnel on the base, 250 of them will be like Army, 250 of them will be like Navy, and it's landlocked. What the heck is the Navy doing there? So then I thought, right, I remember back in Australia, in the Northwest Cape and at Pine Gap, Navy was involved in these super Tesla-type transmitters there. So I put the pictures here of that you can get in Google Earth yourself, and, and I, you know, I show you the latitude and longitude so you can do it. But you can click on the, the ones I've got and see a big picture. You see the big transmitters that send these waves all the way around the Earth and back. And I remember in Pine Gap, which has one of those transmitters right in the middle of it, you can see it in the photos, that tall ball transmitter like Tesla made, before they sighted that, that uh, area where it had to go, they had planes in 1960, uh, it was early 60s, 60, 64, 65, they had a plane flying around circles around a balloon that had a, a wire antenna in it, and they were sending out signals and getting the feedback back and forth, back and forth, to find the exact right spot to put that so that it would generate this standing wave field all the way around the Earth. And I think that's what we're seeing here. And then, the, you know, the, the, the anomaly I was talking about, the temperature anomaly in the ocean, it passed, and I thought, well, I guess they've turned off the test. And then it started, which is it's now in progress, uh, off the, the, the west coast of, uh, of South America. And you can see this huge, big purple-blue uh, pattern forming again. So I looked at the opposite side of that to see where that was. Well, surprise, surprise, it's in China in the desert there near a, an alleged oil refinery, a big, big operation. So I'm wondering if everyone, you know, the Chinese, Americans, and whoever else are playing with these big Tesla-type transmitters now then and generating what's called an antipodal field point on the other side of the Earth. Anyway, I, 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 I put that up there for people to see. Now, the other thing is I could be totally wrong about this. And it's not being caused by these electromagnetic towers and, and, and broadcasts, but it's being caused by what a newly discovered hot plume of, of uh, molten magma under the surface of the Earth that is going to eventually form a huge supervolcano just northeast of um, New Zealand. And what we're seeing, it might be a long stretch of the, of the Earth's surface there that is heating up as this magma plume pushes up to the surface of the Earth right now. So there's two things. One man made one knot, uh, but there's something very unusual happening there. Yeah, exactly. That's interesting. Now, that anomaly, do you see that uh, from Google Earth, or is there a special... Are you looking at frequencies? What is what is the parameter that you're seeing when you look at these maps? Well, well there are several parameters mixed. There's a, um, sea surface temperature... Uh, change, you know, the, uh, the anomaly of it, uh, which is an anomalous temperature change in the ocean. Right. There's electric field electric field changes, high voltage electric field changes, um, and when you put these together, th this is how I, I can create these maps. And so they're they're daily uh, maps that I get from several sources. Uh, uh, you know, I don't get them from the so Navy. So it's a combination of temperature things. change and electrical field change. So the rate of change yeah. Yeah. of the temperature yeah. and the rate of change of the field strength combines to form this dual map. 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's got a, it's the rate at which these things change that I'm, I'm plotting. And right, when change so the rate is a like color this. scale too then. So the color yep. scale goes from what to what? Well, it depends. Uh, because I use red, green, and blue, you have cooling and you have heating and then you have neutral. You know, the green is basically sort of your neutral, but because of the uh, uh, thermal anomalies that I plot into this, you can get green and yellow anomalies over a fault line on either side of it. And normally I will get blue and purple uh, extremities across a fault line, which is kind of what I used to call my butterfly uh, shape. And that tells me that there's a, a, a quake uh, eminent in that area. Uh, the red arrows that I draw in there, I draw attention to anomalous um, fast changes of temperature over large areas just to um, alert people that something is unusual in that area, but I don't know whether it's an earthquake or whether it's um, a storm or what uh, that's coming. But uh, this, this thing in the South Pacific is just huge. I've, I've never seen anything like it and uh, yeah. been doing what it for a long time. One of the things that's going on that has been followed for the last six years is the South Atlantic anomaly, and you're one of the experts on that, where the uh, there's a giant rent in the magnetosphere of the Earth that just, they threw a flew uh, five space satellites through there and found it at uh, something like at 22,000 miles. It's like four times the diameter of Earth. It's a pretty big hole. Uh, and, of course, it narrows down as you get over the South Pacific Ocean. South Atlantic what Ocean. Hole is what, but, the South Atlantic sorry, sorry. anomaly, yeah. Yeah, that whole uh, that they discovered out in space. The uh, yeah, but what are you saying? It's four times the diameter of what? Of the Earth, when you get out to about uh, twenty-two thousand miles near the Van Allen radiation belt, it's a fairly big hole out there, and then it narrows down as it gets over the South Atlantic. Well, it's three million square yeah. miles, old. and it's not at ground level yet. But they say if you ever got to ground level, like over Sao Paulo, Brazil, it would immediately uh, irradiate a lot millions of people in southern South America, like Sao Paulo. Well, uh, actually, I think it's probably happened before that. It's, um, gosh, how many years ago? It was four or five years ago. The um, South Atlantic anomaly was widening and drifting up toward the uh, northern part of South America. And um, when you when you look at the at the map, uh, let's see. Let me just tell you what that is. It's uh, north of Venezuela. There's a little group of islands. I'm just trying to see it now. Where it is? It's just might be Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, yeah, or yeah, in that area there, and, and it might be Aruba. I was getting phone calls from people when the South Atlantic anomaly, the edge of it, the most extreme edge, passed over their island. It, it was a short period uh, that it did that, and in the few days that it happened, their children were getting sick at school and nauseous and disoriented and getting whelps on their skin like little pinpricks were hitting their skin. Adults were getting the same thing and kids were being kept out of school and hospitals were full of people with these symptoms and wanted to know if I knew anything about it. Well, the the thinning of uh, the, the atmosphere over, over the atmosphere and the atmosphere both over them allowed radiation to start striking them from the sun, uh, particularly UV, uh, ultraviolet uh, frequencies. And so if that did happen and the, and the South Atlantic anomaly suddenly just enlarged and went big, it would be very bad for man and beast and flower everything. I mean, flora and fauna would, would suffer. Yeah, so we're on the edge of some kind of a magnetic reversal too, aren't we? Yeah, that's another thing we can talk about with the solar wind. There's something strange happening there. Yeah. Lots of space weather and other uh, things are happening. I believe, you know, as it says, if you use your spidey sense, uh, you can feel that there's something in the wind, as they say. We need to have you back on soon, Stan. An amazing program today. Back in a moment, hour number two, hour three, Michael Connolly of the U.S. Justice Foundation. Major issues of the Second Amendment, executive orders, and Obamacare, and what it's not. We'll be back in just a moment with hour two. Stay tuned. 